uh, we're going to end uh, the Jonah series, and I, I tell you, I, I, I'm grieving a little bit. I, uh, God did, God did a, a work not only in my heart, but God's done a work in the heart of our church as, as we've looked at this issue of uh, the story of Jonah, and we looked at it in a, in a deeper way instead of just like the Veggie Tale version. Uh, we've learned that, you know what, there are some deep stuff in the book of Jonah, and some of it's hard, and some of it's convicting, right? And so today, I've entitled this message, Never Too Good. In other words, we're going to look at Jonah, and we're going to look at God's heart for Jonah, and as a result of that, we're going to see God's heart for us. And so the title of this message is, it's just simply never too good. In other words, Jonah got to this place in life, uh, in a Christian life, to where he, he thought he arrived. He, he thought he was too good, but we're never too good. We're never too good for God's grace. We're never too good for God's mercy. We're never too good for his forgiveness. Uh, we're never too good for a second chance because if we're honest, none of us arrive. There's a dangerous thing in a Christian life to where you get like Jonah. There's a little bit of Jonah's spirit or heart in your heart. And that is this, is to where you come to the place like Jonah and you think, think like Jonah with the Ninevites, he, the reason he didn't want to extend God's grace to them is, is he believed their sin was greater than his sin. And he believed because he judged them, God should judge them. He believed because they were enemies of his, they should be enemies of God. And Jonah got to this place, which is a really destructive place for a church or for a Christian to get, in, to, to, get to in, the, in, in, in Christian life. And here's the interesting thing. God, God wasn't after Jonah for what God could do, for what Jonah could do for him. It's just so amazing that God's, God's goal for Jonah was not to get Jonah to go to Nineveh. Uh, it was deeper than that. God desired a relationship with him. God's aim for Jonah is the same aim that he has for us. His aim was Jonah's, Jonah's heart. And so when, when, when Jonah had finished God's mission, you still see it. God's still chasing after Jonah. And God chased after Jonah. Listen, and God chase, chases after you, not for what you can do for him, but because he comes after you because he wants a relationship with you. His aim is, is, is your heart. And so just a little bit of, of, of history in case you're new and you haven't been through this series. <coughs> Jonah is like a spiritual leader of his day. He's a pastor. Uh, he, he's been to seminary. He's been pastoring for, a, for, for a quite a while and then all of a sudden, God comes to him, and God asks him to do something he doesn't want to do. And God asked him to go to Nineveh, and he hated the Ninevites. They st stood for everything that he was against. And so he hated the Ninevites, and so he, he didn't want to do that. And so as a result, Jonah runs in the opposite direction. And so we, we've talked about this. We've talked about how it doesn't work for us when we run from God. And the problem is because God will chase after us. God will not give up on us. I mean, when you ask the question, you say, who would want to run from, who would want to run from God? The God that is, 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 has this unfailing love that is grace, gracious and forgiving and merciful. And so we learn that God, through the book, we learn that God is sovereign. God's in control. It is so much better when we run with God instead of running against God. We've got watch storm. We watch God use circumstances and storms in Jonah's life to get his attention, uh, to, to work on his heart, to deal with some issues. Uh, when, when Jonah, remember, when he was in the fish, that's where Jonah had some time to reflect, and so he repented and said, I'm so sorry that I hated the Ninevites. I'm so sorry that I thought these things. God, I'm sorry. So repentance is change of mind that leads to a change of direction, and he repents, and he goes the opposite direction, and he heads to Nineveh. So he goes to, to Nineveh, and he, and he preaches God's message. And so here, 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 here's, the, here's, the, here's the problem with all this. Jonah outwardly obeyed God. But inwardly, he was not on the same page with God. Inwardly, his heart was at war against God. In other words, Jonah had been a, he had been a God follower long enough that he, he knew what it meant to go through the motions. He could go through the motions. He knew the right things to say, but the problem was, was not the outward, it was the inward. See, God's aim for Jonah was his heart, and God's aim for us is, 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 is our heart. And so Joan, God was after Jonah's heart, and so Jonah's like just going through the motions, and so he, he, it appears to be he's living out of obedience. He goes to Nineveh. He preaches a message that, that God is going to, you know, like turn or burn. God's mad at you. God's going to judge you if, and destroy you if you don't repent. Now, that, that part of the message, God is going to judge you. God is mad at you. Jonah had to like that part of the message, right? The problem was they listened. And the problem was they, they like repented and God had mercy on them and they quit doing all the evil things that they were doing. And so, so the book of Jonah is a, is a story about a God of a second chance, even to a person like, like Jonah or to anyone who will humble themselves and turn back to him. 
Now, the Bible says that God delights in showing mercy to us. Romans tells us it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And so God affords all of us that. And many times, if we're not careful, we can start in the Christian life and say the Christian life is about grace and forgiveness, but something happens along the way. And the point of the story is, is there is a God in heaven that loves you more than you could ever imagine. Listen, just so we're tracking this morning, we, we, we understand that love. The grace of God runs lower than your worst sin. The grace of God runs lower than your worst mistake. And we all stand in need of that. None of us are too good. None of us have arrived. None of us are too good for his mercy and his forgiveness and his, his unfailing love. And so J Jonah knew a lot of things about God. He knew about the grace of God. And in fact, is he had written about it. Remember that? We looked at that when he's in the fish. He writes a prayer of gratitude, and he was grateful for all God had done in his life and how he forgave him. And, and when grace was given to him, he found it amazing. But when grace was extended to someone else that he didn't like, he didn't find it so amazing. And he gets mad. There's a couple of things that frustrate me with the book of Jonah. <coughs> One is that there's four chapters, and it really and truly should have ended in chapter 3. If Jonah had a, not had a heart issue, really and truly, the book of Jonah should have in, ended in Jonah chapter 3. Jonah goes to Nineveh, preaches repentance to the people. The Ninevites all turn. They all repent. Uh, they, all, they all begin to follow God. They become God followers. And, and as a result of that, the, the last verse, Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, should have read, they turned from their evil ways, they repented, and Jonah and the Ninevites lived happily ever after. They a, built a great church, they did fellowships together, and they loved one another from that moment on. But unfortunately, that's not how the story ends. Scripture says when they did that, Jonah gets angry. So we're going to walk through 11 verses this morning. <clears throat> and I apologize to you after, after three services. Uh, one of the constant uh, questions that I've got is, hey, Pastor Charlie, usually you have a joke or two. There were no jokes in this sermon. Uh, I'll try to throw a joke in. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. I, I really believe God has a lot to say to us this morning. Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. So that people repent. It says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And so he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is, why I made <coughs> this is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slowing to anger, abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. Therefore now, when he is having a bad day, O oh Lord, just take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than live. God, just kill me now. And he's angry, right? In the original language, I, me, my, appears nine times. I mean, this is, this is like a selfish prayer. Jonah is like self-absorbed. It's all about him. Uh, Jonah really believes, God, you should shape your will to my will. God, you should judge the people I judge. God, you should hate the people I hate. God, my enemies should be your enemies. In other words, for Jonah, it was all, of, it was all about Jonah. It was all about Jonah because Jonah thought he'd arrived. Jonah thought he got to this place that he's too good. He doesn't really need God's grace and God's forgiveness. I mean, like everybody else does. And so Jonah wanted destruction for the Ninevites without any chance for them to repent. Listen, I'm telling you, if we're not careful, it's easy to assume in our life that God is with us more than he is with our enemies. That God is with me more than the people that I disagree with politically. God is with me more than the people that I disagree with their lifestyle. God is with me more than those people that I believe have worse sins than mine. God is with me more than the people that have hurt me. God is with me more than the people that have betrayed me. You see, this is just dangerous ground. See, the problem is this. Jonah's heart opposes God outwardly. And he looks perfect. But inwardly, there's this, this is war going on. And when God saw the, the, the repentance of the Ninevites, he forgave them and showed them grace and mercy. And Jonah gets angry. You know why Jonah got angry? Because he didn't see people the way God saw people. God is slow to anger. <coughs> Jonah is quick to anger. And all of a sudden in circumstances, and, and maybe you've seen some of this in, in, in your life, in your circumstances, there's something about a storm. There's something about circumstances that we can go through in life. And things can bubble up in our heart that we didn't know were there. And you see this in Jonah's life. We see things in Jonah's heart that comes out. It's anger and bitterness and and this anger and bitterness leads to depression. And many times the reason we get angry and many times the reason we get bitter and even depressed 
is really and truly is because our heart opposes God. We don't like what he's doing. We don't like what he's doing in the situation. We don't like what he's doing in, in, in the circumstance. See, God desires that our heart would reflect his heart for people. Uh, people matter to God and people should matter to us. But when, when we don't love what he loves, when we don't love who he loves, that's when our hearts have a tendency to become bitter and angry and we think it's just totally unfair. In verse 2, Jonah was self-justifying. So he thought he would say, you know what, I'll just lay out my theology for God. And it's not going to come up on the screens, but, but in verse 2, <coughs> he lays out his theology and he says, For I knew you're gracious and a merciful God, you're slow to anger, you're bounding in steadfast love, and you're relenting from disaster. In other words, in other words, outwardly Jonah can say the right things, but inwardly his heart opposes God. He says, God, I knew you were going to do this. I knew you were going to forgive them. I knew you were going to love them. Love them. I knew you were going to be gracious. In other, words, in other words, he said, I knew this. Listen, let me tell you something. Jonah does not have a theology problem. Jonah has a heart problem. I'm telling you, right theology without love is brutal. More churches are known for their right theology and not their love for people. More churches are known for their right theology and the people who they are against, the people who they judge, the people who they talk about, rather than loving people. I'm telling you, right theology without love is brutal. You cannot criticize someone, you cannot judge someone and bring them to Christ at the same time. And see, this is Jonah's problem. And Jonah is saying, you know what, I have right theology, God, and that's why I ran. That's why I didn't love the Ninevites. God, you know these people are my enemy. They should be your enemy. You know, you know I've judged them. You should judge them. I know I hate them. You should hate them. You know what they've done. They're rebellious and they're not good people. And then he goes and he begins to question their motives. This is so dangerous in life. And we live in a culture, we live in a time where people question one another's motives. And so Jonah's like, God, they're not even sorry for their, their repentance, not real repentance. I mean, sure they're going to repent if I tell them you're going to kill them if they don't. So all of a sudden, he judges. Have you ever had anyone judge your motives? I know why you did that. I know why you said that. Isn't it paralyzing? Isn't it paralyzing? The most dangerous thing we can do is question someone's motives. It's, it's dangerous. And Jeremiah says, the heart is wicked and deceitful. Who can understand it? There are times, if we're honest, we don't even understand our motives. Much less try to understand somebody else's motives. And the most dangerous thing we can do is question people's motives. I know I'm simple, but I, I simply dream of the day when a chicken can cross the road and nobody questions their motives. <laughs> There's your humor. <laughs> awesome. I don't know why the chicken crossed the road. And I don't know why people do what they do. It's not my job. See, Jonah is angry. He has just received grace. And he literally hates what God has done. Jonah knew some things about God, but he didn't delight in those things about God. Jonah didn't love the things that God loved. It's so interesting to me that, that, that Jonah knew the right thing to do, but he didn't do it. I mean, isn't that true in our life? We can know the right thing to do. A lot of times it's not because we don't know that's wrong or we don't know that's sin. A lot of times we know I should not, if I do that, it's going to cause problems. But we do it. Why? It's a heart problem. This is what God is helping Jonah to understand. Jesus would say in, in the gospel over and over and over, listen, it's not just correct theology. But it's a correct love for others. The way we express our theology, the way we express our beliefs, the way we express our love for God is how we love others. That's why Jesus said, greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind. If it was only, listen, if it was only about theology, if it was only about re right thinking, God would have stopped there. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Oh, if it's genuine, love your neighbor as yourself. Fact is, you and I, you want to know your theology? It's how you love others. It's how you love others. And this is Jonah. And I mean, Jonah's getting to the place. Remember verse 3? God, just kill me now. Just kill me now. Jonah's depressed. Listen, even, even as a God follower, even as believers, 
our priorities, our action towards others, our heart can get so messed up that we're just angry at God, we're bitter at God, and we want to give up. Then you ask the question, how did Jonah get there? Well, let's ask a deeper question. How do we get there? Why all the anger? Why all the bitterness in Jonah's heart? Now, here's the crazy thing. Jonah wanted to give up on God, but God refused to give up on Jonah. You know why that should be, bring us comfort? Even when we get in those motives. Even when, we get in, even when we get in those times. Even when we get in that period, that, I, God, I just want to give up. I hate what you're doing. I don't even like this. Can I just tell you this? God loves you too much. God will not give up on you. Even though we may want to give up on God, God does not want to give up on us, and he chases after us. Listen, there's a, there's a lot of people that will look at this issue of anger and bitterness, and, and sometimes it leads to depression and, and because of the circumstances, because of the situation. And many Christians will say, well, you know what? The reason I'm angry, the reason I'm bitter, the reason I'm almost depressed because of the circumstances is because I feel God is far away. I feel God is distant. I don't feel like he's present. Can I tell you this? Jonah's stories proves this theological, biblical fact that when we're in those circumstances and we're frustrated, we're angry, and we're bitter, it's not because God is absent. It's because he's present. It's because he's pressing into our heart. It's because he's pressing against our heart. So you, you just see this in the scripture. The more that Jonah pushed against the heart of God, God pressed that much harder into the heart of Jonah. He's pressing against your heart. He presses against my heart with circumstances and storms and situations. And sometimes you can get to the place you just, you just hate what he's doing. And you know that he wants you to change. And if you're angry and bitter and mad and depressed today have you ever considered the fact that it may not be because he's absent in your circumstance but he's present in your circumstance he's present in your storm he's present in your circumstance because he's he's after your heart this is the best kind of pressure there ever is because you know what that means that means God will not give up on you this reminds me that guess what we're, we're safe with God Jonah was so honest with God God's Jonah's like God this isn't fair that you would give the Ninevites a second chance. And Jonah's exactly right. It is not fair. It is not fair that God would give Jonah a second chance. It is not fair that God would let Jonah be a spokesperson for him. It is not fair that God would allow Jonah to talk to him the way that he does. But that's grace. And that's forgiveness. And that's mercy. See, Jonah can't see any of this in his own life because of his selfishness. Because he's self-absorbed. And he thinks he's simply too good. It's amazing to me that a lot of times in our heart, we can be grateful or we can be, thank be thankful that God has showed us mercy, that God has forgiven us, and then we can be appalled and angry that he showed grace and forgiveness to a girl like that or to a boy like that. Jonah would be that guy that would say grace is for average sinners like me, but not hardcore sinners like you or hardcore sinners like the Ninevites. Our job is to hate sin. It's God's job to deal with the sinner. God has called us to despise evil. That's clear in Scripture, but we should never despise people. And God wants, to, wants us to have the same kind of heart towards sin as he does, but he also wants us to have the same kind of heart towards the sinner as he does. Jesus told this story in Luke chapter 7, verse 47, about this lady that came to Christ, and she had a, a pretty bad past. And he writes these words where he says, he says, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. See, that was Jonah's problem. He thought he was too good. He didn't think he was forgiven of much. Listen, let me tell you something. It does not matter your testimony. It doesn't matter if you're raised in a Christian home and you met Christ at, at like the age of six and, and the worst rebellious thing that you ever did is reading a book under a dim light, you know. We all have been forgiven of much. And unfortunately, there's some people that just think they're good and they're too good and they think God hasn't really forgiven me much. And what the scripture says, when you don't realize that you've been forgiven of much, you don't love much. Man, Jonah's like, I don't mind telling my enemies that, God, you're mad at them. But I didn't expect you to extend grace to them. And this revival turns out, and then, then, then we're going to see this. God puts on the heart of a counselor. Verse 4, he, he asks a question, and he'll come back to it again. Verse 4, as we just track through this, 
And so the Lord said to Jonah, do you do you do well to be angry? He's asking him, do you have a right to be angry? Are you angry over the right stuff? And so God is so loving and patient with Jonah. And now all of a sudden you see God's heart as a counselor comes alongside of him. Here's an interesting thing. Jonah is so angry, he can't even answer God. He, he runs again. I thought he was over that. See, Jonah's dealing with a root issue in his life. Verse 5, so Jonah went out to the city. In other words, he, he, didn't, he didn't answer God. Went out of the city, sat to the east of the city, and made a booth for himself there. He sat, he sat under it in the shade till he should see what should become of the city. See, here's the indication right here is Jonah didn't think they were genuine in their repentance. He questioned their motives. What he was expecting to see is expecting to watch God judge them when all of a sudden the Ninevites, when, when God realized it, it wasn't for real. Verse 6, now the Lord appointed a plant, so important, made it come up over Jonah that it may be shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. <coughs> There's four different times in the book of Jonah that you see the word appointed. God appointed some circumstances in his life to deal with Jonah's heart. Uh, over a fish, a wind, the sun, a plant. Uh, four different times, all of a sudden you see these, these divine appointments in Jonah's life that God was using to bring Jonah back to him. Listen, I've learned this. Our hearts are changed through divine appointments in our life. And many times we don't like it. And many times it's painful. And many times it's uncomfortable. And here's the amazing thing. God, Jonah's running from God again after he repented of that. And all of a sudden, God is pursuing him and he's providing for him, shade for him. And Jonah is trying to help him understand, or God's trying to help Jonah understand that he is the God of a second chance. And Jonah, God is dealing with this root issue in Jonah's life. I mean, has that ever happened to you? We see that a couple of times in Jonah's life. One, he repented in, in the belly of the fish for ha hating the Ninevites and said, I, I will go to them. And so he goes to him, and, and, and he thought he was done with that sin, and then all of a sudden something happens, and that sin comes back up in his life. If that ever happened to you, don't answer that out loud. You don't want to turn it into testimony time, especially at this point of the sermon. It would be awkward. Uh, have you ever dealt with a sin issue in your life? And you truly repented? God, I'm so sorry. And it was a change of mind that led to a change of direction. And you started going the opposite direction. Then a week later, two weeks later, six months later, a year later, that sin comes back up in your life. You go, oh, I thought I was so done with that. It's happened to me. The book of Jonah tells us. God still chases after us. God is still the God of a second chance. God understands, Jonah, you're dealing with a root issue. What we've been doing, we've been taking this root issue and we've been whacking it off at the surface like, like a weed and it grows back. And so you know what God's doing through this divine appointment? You know what God's doing through these circumstances? He's digging around in the soil of Jonah's heart and say, we're going to deal with this once and for all so you don't have to deal with this any longer, Jonah. Man, you look at this, you think one of these experiences would change Jonah's heart. I mean, I, I, mean, I, got, the, I, mean, I got the question of how many divine appointments do you need? You know what God would say? God would say as many as it takes. Because God's aim is not for what we can do for him. God's aim is our heart. God's aim is to capture our entire heart. And so maybe Jonah, listen, maybe Jonah wasn't having a storm at all. Maybe Jonah wasn't having a bad set of circumstances. Maybe Jonah was having a divine appointment. That God was saying, Jonah, let's just deal with this. Maybe God is using some divine appointments in your life currently. Maybe God is using some circumstances, some situations in your life, and he's trying to teach you, you know what, I'm going to teach you how to, how to trust me. I just want to teach you how to trust me when the future seems uncertain, when you don't know how the, certain, the, the future, I am bringing you to a place that you're going to trust in me. You're not going to trust, trust in your income. You're not going to trust in the economy. I am going to bring you to a place where you're going to trust me. Maybe for you, there's some divine appointments going on, and God is trying to teach you about prayer. And I'm going to teach you about prayer and the power of prayer. Maybe for some of you, it may be an approval issue. Maybe God is trying to teach you and say, you know what? You've been trying to get the approval of a bunch of people, a person, they're never going to give you their approval. And I'm going to break you free of that. And I'm going to help you to understand who you are in Christ. You only need my approval. 
Maybe God is using some divine appointments in your life and help you through some insecurities that you have and helping you to understand in Christ you are secure, you are safe in him. And he is the God of love and compassion and forgiveness. Maybe God is using some divine appointments in your life just like he's doing with Jonah. He's teaching you how to love people. He's teaching you how to, pers- how to pray for those who persecute you. He's trying to teach you how to pray for those who hurt you. Many times like Jonah, we go through these circumstances and, and we don't see it for our good. So we get angry, we get bitter, and we get depressed. Verse 7, but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed, so you see that word again, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant <coughs> so it, that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die. And he said, it's better for me to die than to live. I mean, Jonah, what is up with you? He won't even get off of this. See, Jonah is thinking, you know what? Life is just not fair. It's not worth living. I must have caused a storm. I got thrown overboard. I'm swallowed by a fish. I have right theology. I know the right thing to do. Everybody else is wrong but me. I get embarrassed. I'm hot. I'm thirsty. I'm tired. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I have fear. I feel like, God, you betrayed me because you have sent me to the Ninevites, so I'm just angry. Now watch this. Here's how loving God is. Verse 9. But God said to Jonah again, Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? He's like, Jonah, I know you're angry. Are you angry over the right things? Jonah, your priorities messed up. And so watch this. I cannot believe he said this. And Jonah said, yes, I do well to be angry. Angry enough to die. I'm like, you actually said that out loud? You You see the grace of God? To let him talk to him like that? Verse 10, and so the Lord said, you pity the plant, just real quickly, the word pity in in, in the Hebrew, this is the deepest form of grieving and mourning. This is like grieving the loss of a a loved one, a husband, a a, a parent, a child. This is the, he's grieving over a plant. He says, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in in a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city? in which there are more than (coughs) 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left. That's just an Old Testament way of saying they don't know me. They don't know God. They're lost. And also much their cattle. You know what God said by saying cattle? He said, I not only love them, I love their animals. I not only love them, I love their profession. I love their income. I love their life. I love what they do. I love them. And Jonah, like, justifies his anger. He he self-justifies. He said, I have a right to be angry. And I'm so angry. I'm so mad I'm angry enough to die. And you know what? God responds to Jonah's emotion. God kindly responds to his emotion. And he doesn't discount it. Listen, it can be hurtful, right? It can be hurtful in conversations. When you have emotion, when you're having a disagreement, and someone discounts your emotion, say, you don't have a right to feel that way. You don't have a right that you don't have a right to have those emotions. And I cannot believe you would feel that way. I cannot believe you have those emotions. Isn't it, isn't it paralyzing in conversations when you're having that conversation and someone tells you, you don't have a right to feel that way? Can I tell you this? God doesn't do that. God never told Jonah, Jonah, you do not have a right to have those emotions. You do not have a right to feel that way. God continues to press in. Listen, let me tell you something. Whatever emotion that you are feeling today, God sees you. And God is simply calling you to reason with him. And Jonah is angry at a plant. And God shows unbelievable patience with Jonah. You know what God is saying? Jonah, you pity the plant. And you don't pity people. Jonah, can I just press into your heart? You love a plant more than you love people. Jonah, your priorities are messed up, buddy. You have more compassion for a plant. Then you do people. Jonah, people should matter to you because they matter to me and people should matter to us. 
regardless if they have a different lifestyle, regardless if they have different sin issues, regardless if they dress different than us. Jonah, 120,000 people live in this community. They do not know me. And you don't even pity them. And Jack Hayford is a, a pastor, and he's like in his 90s, and he's written so many worship songs. Five years ago, I had the opportunity in just a small meeting with a group of pastors, five or six of us, and Pastor Jack was there. He told us about a story early in this ministry that, that changed him. He pastors a church, it's a large church when he was pastoring in, in California. He's in, he's, in, he's in driving and traffic, and some Texan probably cut in on him and So there's two, two jokes. <laughs> and Pastor Jack said real quickly, he said, I didn't, I didn't flip him off. I didn't stick my head out the window and yell at him, but I, I called him a bad word in my car. And he said, immediately, it's like God took me back to the story of Jonah. And it's like, it's, it's like, it's like in my spirit, I, I just heard that Jack, that person... I created them in my image. I love them. He said, I never have forgotten that ministry is about, is about people. And so God's trying to help Jonah understand that your priorities are messed up. They were to love the Lord our God with all your heart and soul and mind. And we were to love our neighbor as, your, as ourself and God's saying, Jonah, what's wrong with your heart? You've been, you've been like my spokesperson for years, but you've never captured my heart for these people. Jonah, you have great theology. I am gracious. I am loving. I am compassionate, and I'm slow to anger, and I'm abounding in love, and I'm, I'm a God who relents calamity. Jonah, your problem is not a theology problem. It's a, it's a people pr problem. Do you love people like I do? See, God is trying to capture Jonah's heart. and One of the frustrations that I've always had with the book of Jonah, and I kind of solved it this last week, and I'd like to process it out with you as we close. I hate the way the book of Jonah ends. It's just, it's like, it's like it ends with a question. It's open-ended. It reminds me, and my wife and I, we, uh, our, our kids make fun of us because we're both obsessive-compulsive. So I'm telling you, there's nobody in this room that can binge watch a series quicker than Karen and I. I mean, we'll binge watch through the night, and the only question is who's putting on another pot of coffee, right? It doesn't matter if we have to go to work or the next day. we got a goal, and the goal is to finish the series. And I don't know if you're like me, but when I binge watch a series and I get to the end, and it's like, what? There's no closure. I'm mad. I'm the one mad in the room. I'm like, 30, how many, 30 hours into this series? 30 hours, and now, you know, what, what did Jack do? And, and where's Jack? And what is Jack? I said, I cannot. Even, or, or you're in the middle of a series, and they decide not to continue the next season, and you, they just left you hanging. I'm angry. I'm the one angry in the room. And so I had that same feeling with the book of Jonah. Watch this, and it's not going to come up. Just let me read you. This is how it ends. This is how the book of Jonah ends. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also... Much cattle, question mark, and the credits roll. And I'm the guy like, what? <laughs> they left the story unfinished. It's unfinished. You know why they do that? There's only two books of the Bible. First or second John, the book of John. I mean, the first or second John or the book of Jonah that does this. It's open-ended. You know why? It forces us to contemplate our own ending. Come up with our own conclusion. I told you when we started this journey out together in the book of Jonah, this is not a story about Jonah. This is a story about God. This is a story about God and how God responds to us and how we respond to him. The point of this story is not, John, is not Jonah, what are you going to do? The point of this story is, what are we going to do? And God is saying to us and saying, God is saying, should I be like you or should you be like me? Should I love people like you love people or should you love people like I love people? Should you have mercy and grace and forgiveness? Should I have mercy and grace and forgiveness like yours? Or you should, should you have mercy and grace and forgiveness like me? 
Should I join you in your mission or should you join me in my mission? Should I live for your glory or should you live for my glory? Should I submit to your plans or should you submit to my plans? See, this story is not about Joan at all. This story is about us and how we respond to God. So the question for us is, church, what's it going to be? Write your own ending to the story. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes?